This is Keep On Cooking, a podcast for people who love cookbooks and want to know more about the authors. It's also a great place to get a weekly dose of culinary inspiration to keep things pumping in the kitchen. So grab a cookbook and keep on cooking. I'm Dustin Harder, and this is Keep On Cooking. Hello, and welcome to Keep On Cooking, the only podcast dedicated to plant based cookbooks. I'm your host, Dustin Harder, and he once watched me search for my keys for an entire hour before admitting that he accidentally put them in his own bag. It's Mr. Roro getting on the go go. How you doing, Mr. Rosetti? It was me. <laughs> it's it's me. me. It's me. Uh, do you remember that? It's me. Yes. That was like really Dude, super, uh, super fun times for vaguely. me. I know. It was, it was like the best times. times. I actually handled that very well. You did. You did. It was like, it was an hour of me searching for my keys because it was right before I went to bed I and I was, You're I couldn't your mind. go to bed not knowing where they, and I'm listening to this podcast called Scam Goddess. Scam Goddess. Scam Goddess. Um, which I love. Hosted by Lacey, something I can't remember last name, but Scam Goddess. Free shout out. There you go. Um, but it's like a true crime podcast, only without the death. It's about people doing scams. So my brain just kept going, someone scammed me out of my keys oh my today, God. and they're gonna someone... steal my car tonight. That's what's gonna happen. Um, so I was kind of losing my mind looking for them. I couldn't go to bed until I found them. And finally, I'm like, I'm just going to bed. I'm going to settle down. And David gets up and goes into the closet. And he's like, um, um, don't be mad. <laughs> I'm like, what? He's like, the keys are in my bag. I accidentally put them in my bag. I'm like, oh, sorry. You mean that question I asked you like twice in the last hour? Sorry. Uh, uh, it's all right. It's all right. Listen, we're here to talk about plantology. Give me that plantology. No, it's hard not to do that. Plantology. Now you ask, what does it mean? Okay. Why it's the study of science between plants and eating. Give me that plantology, that P-L-A-N-T-O-L-O-G. Kind of, right? Yeah. So that is a parody of, a very good parody, thank you so much, of Paula Abdul's Vibology. Vibology. Uh, so we're here to talk about Plantology, a cookbook based on the science of plant-based eating by Dr. Sharon Burquist and Jenny Bilko. I absolutely adored getting to chat with these two phenomenal humans, truly filling us in on the science of plants and getting their readers energized to cook plant-based foods. Jenny Bilko is a registered dietitian for the Emory Executive Health Clinic, the Paul WCV Comprehensive Internal Medicine Clinic, and Emory Lifestyle Medicine and Wellness. She has over seven years of experience providing nutrition, education, and counseling to patients for prevention and management of chronic diseases through plant-based eating. She received a Bachelor's of Science degree in dietetics from the University of Georgia. She completed her dietetic internship and master's degree in nutrition science at University University of Alabama, Birmingham, and she has a certificate in training for vegetarian nutrition. Now, Dr. Sharon Horish Burquist is a practicing internal medicine physician, scientist, and lifestyle medicine pioneer with over 25 years of experience in patient centered clinical care. She is the Pam R. Rollins Professor of Medicine at Emory University School of Medicine, the Medical Director of Emory's Executive Health Program, and the Founder and Director of Emory Lifestyle Medicine and Wellness. That's right, and it's all about plantology. I had to do it one more time. Now you're gonna do Can it you one give more it time. to me? Can you, you give me a little plantology? <laughs> plantology. <laughs> Everybody, don't leave us. Don't we're okay. trying our best here. We're giving we're hitting Plantology. it. Oh, well, Dr. B has been the lead investigator or co-investigator in over a dozen clinical trials using evidence-based lifestyle interventions for the prevention and management of disease and for evaluating early biomarkers for well-being, chronic disease, and healthy aging, including ongoing studies looking for early markers of Alzheimer's disease and cancer. She has received over 30 patient care awards and been voted one of Atlanta's top doctors for multiple consecutive years. Well, look at her. Look at her. Now, Dr. Sharon has been interviewed by over 200 news segments, including Good Morning America, CNN, ABC News, The Wall Street Journal, NPR, and Women's Health Magazine, to name a few. 
Uh, Dr. Sharon completed her undergraduate degree in biochemistry and biophysics at Yale College and attended Harvard Medical School. What, like it's hard? Mm, what, like it's hard? What, like it's hard? And completed her internship and residency in internal medicine at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. That is a difficult one to say, right? It's actually well, because Faulkner, I say... Brigham and Women. Oh, uh, Brigham and well, listen, I didn't put it in here because this is what was in the bio, so maybe it's not. But I'm doing, I'm working with this hospital right now to do some stuff coming up in April, and I think it's Faulkner, Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Oh. Isn't that hard? Why well, is that hard? Why is that? And I see not Brigham, and I think for some reason I think Brigham Young. Like I, there's something yeah, else. Yeah, that maybe that's too, it. But maybe. That's that's it. Anyway. But good job, babe. Thank you. Good job. Uh, listen, they're they're not just smarty pants. They're also very fun and lovely to talk to. And they've created some awesome recipes in here. This book is full of education too. It really is just a great book and and um, just cool to have them on. You can listen also to Dr. Sharon's podcast, The Whole Health Cure, everywhere you listen to podcasts. I've had the privilege of being a guest on there and I absolutely had the best time. And these women are bringing something great to the plant-based space. So let's get into it. They make it educational, but fun, informative, accessible, and approachable. Here to talk about plantology, 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 a cookbook based on the science of plant-based eating. Please welcome Dr. Sharon Hiroche Berquist and Jenny Bilko. They are here to enlighten us on the science of plant-based eating. It's my pleasure to welcome to the Keep On Cooking podcast, dietitian Jenny Bilko and Dr. Sharon Burquist. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So happy you're here. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. Yes, absolutely. We're going to dive right into your icebreaker. Uh, I've only asked this question once before, and I'm very curious to know your answer. On an airplane... Do you prefer the window or an aisle seat? And then, of course, I want to know why you choose what you choose. So um, I'll go first. Um, window. I love seeing the lights, the cities on takeoff, on landing. I want to get a sky view of whatever city we're flying over. So window for me. I love it. I agree. I'm definitely a window person. I like being able to like huddle in my little corner <laughs> and then sleep and then also see the view. I'm very like, I'm going to take a picture of every single thing that's down there. So very I love it. That's a very positive outlook for the window seat. I myself am a window person, but I became a window person because I used to be an aisle person. Uh -huh. And then I would get knocked all the time by like the cart or people. And I was like, okay, I'm going to switch to the window. But now I go to the window. You guys would not want to sit with me. I close the window and I'm like, <laughs> I'm curling up here. I don't want anyone to bother me for these next couple hours. And then I'm just going to mind my own business. It doesn't always go that way. And sometimes I'm in a more positive mood than that. But really I'm, it's like the, the window seat speaks to the introvert in my soul, basically. <laughs> Absolutely same. Yeah. <laughs> but I do sometimes yeah. pop it open when I know we're going over some scenic stuff and take take off and landing and all that so i do get in the mood to take some pictures sometimes uh well we're here today to talk about your beautiful new book plantology well not exactly new now how long has this book been out we've been trying to schedule this for a while when did it come out um it was april of 2023 april 2023 that's right so plantology a cookbook based on the science of plant-based eating now you're on a mission with this book to show everyone how simple incorporating more natural plant-based foods can be, combining your decades of experience from your clinical work, research, and culinary skills, you describe the compelling science and pair it with practical tips and easy, delicious recipes. Your hope is that this easy-to-follow guide will inspire others to prevent disease, increase vibrancy, and live longer. I think we can all get on board with that. And when we talk about science and plants and preventing disease, can you share with our listeners, if you can, sort of a brief summary of how plant-based whole foods protect against disease? What is the science behind that? When it comes to plant-based eating, um, I'm always talking about the anti-inflammatory power that plant-based eating has for us, right? And we know that inflammation plays a big role in the root cause of chronic diseases like heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and plants provide us with all the ammo against inflammation through the nutrients that they provide. So we know plants are really, really great sources of fiber, 
vitamins, minerals, antioxidants that are anti-inflammatory nutrition nutrients that help us fight chronic disease. The good stuff. All the good stuff, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that is a very simplistic way. Dr. I love Mark, it. I'm sure has so many different science and studies and different things that she can mention in that as well. Absolutely. I'll echo Jenny. So the power of plant food is fiber and phytochemicals. You do not get that in animal-based foods. And we know that both fiber has been associated with reducing the risk of virtually every chronic disease, helping people live longer, and ditto for phytochemicals. I mean, we have over 100,000 phytochemicals, and they're the kind of secret sauce behind the plants, right? They provide the anti-inflammatories, the antioxidants, anti-cancer mechanisms, and the more variety and abundance of plants, the more phytochemicals and the more disease-fighting power. So our goal is really to expose people to not just plant food, but the abundance and the flavors and the variety, because the more you take in of the different plants and enjoy the abundance, the healthier you're going to be. That's great. And I love the talk of the variety. Listeners, I'm holding this book up now. It's got a beautiful co cover on it. Gorgeous, full of lots of color. We're talking about variety already. And then eating the rainbow, really, too. I mean, it's on the cover here. We've got the rainbow. But there's such a variety of recipes in here. I mean, I'm talking sometimes a two-page spread has like four to six recipes on there. And when I say that, the best part about that, listeners, is that means that these recipes are approachable, they're accessible, they're easy to tackle, which is a big thing for a lot of people. And the book starts out with a great intro describing what a plant-based way of eating is and the power of a plant-based diet, which we just talked about a little. And you also have five steps to healthier eating under the header, how do I switch to a whole food diet? So what do those five steps look like? Yeah. Also, so the backstory behind that, Dustin, is Jenny and I take care of a lot of patients and we found ourselves spending a lot of time in clinic explaining to them individually, you know, the benefits of plant-based plant -based diets, but then how to get people started, right? So telling people what's good for them is very different than helping them actually do it. And so we thought, what are five ways to just help people make that transition? Um, what we, you know, we both do this a lot, but one of the favorite things I like to tell people is to flip the ratios of their food. So a lot of people, um, you know, who do have, you know, non-plant items on their plate um, and are trying to transition to plant-based, we just encourage them to kind of, um, kind of supersize, if you will, the plant-based portion mm -hmm. and minimize the animal-based portion just to start to flip the ratio of the food. So it's trying to help people. You don't have to start off by excluding entirely, but let's just swap the ratio. And it's just an incremental process to help people get started. And another big one is we want people to focus on the, not the quantity of the different macronutrients, but the quality of each one, right? So we're so hung up on what's the right amount of protein versus fat mm. versus carbohydrates. And when you look at the blue zones and you know, areas of the world where people live the longest, they vary dramatically in the ratio of the macronutrients. The common theme is that they all have whole foods and predominantly plant-based. So we want people to think about foods as quality and then really think about the difference of the quality of getting the macronutrients from plant sources versus animal sources. So we're kind of helping people reframe how they are viewing what's quote healthy. Um, and then another really common way we help people transition is just simply add a little bit more you know, fruit, a little bit more vegetable, because the more good stuff you add, well, the, you become fuller and there's less room yeah. for the bad stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So that's like a really simple way. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Those are, are great tips. I love the idea of swapping out, you know, the, the non plant-based product, making it smaller and making the vegetable portion essentially bigger, right? Or the plant-based portion bigger. Uh, and you've got this great, you, you start off with a whole foods plant-based plate in here. I love this. It breaks it down. Half plate of vegetables, quarter plate, plate, plate of legumes, and a quarter plate of whole grains. So your first chapter of recipes is titled simply vegetables. 
I think we can all get on board there. <laughs> vegetables, you talk about vegetable families, starchy vegetables, cruciferous vegetables, allium vegetables, mushrooms, raw versus cooked. So much great information in here. How to get kiddos to eat more veggies even, and fresh, frozen, and canned. So when we look at those three, fresh, frozen, and canned, Jenny, are they nutritionally comparable? Yes. So when we think about uh, the differences between the nutrition contents of fresh versus frozen versus canned, they're actually quite similar. So when you look at frozen produce, you're actually getting a more fresh produce because they're being flash frozen at the time of picking and then they are immediately being taken to the grocery store right so all that nutrition content that's there right at the beginning of when you pick it stays the same right now when we're getting fresh produce still amazing and great but oftentimes it's being transported to wherever the destination is that you're buying that produce from, right? So that nutrition content can sometimes decline on the trip on the way to the grocery store. Now, canned vegetables, it's a little bit different, right? So they're a little bit different than fresh and frozen. But what's cool about certain canned veggies is when you cook certain things like tomatoes, for example, some of those nutrients actually get boosted. So tomatoes have an amazing antioxidant called lycopene, and that actually gets boosted the more that you cook a tomato. So there are certain vegetables that when you're cooking them down or when they're canned, you're actually getting more of that antioxidant there. So having a wide variety of those fresh, frozen, and canned not only is helpful in terms of nutrient content, but also gives you more wide variety of convenience for fruits and veggies as well. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Convenience is big, right? And I also think about... For me, you know, if I get vegetables, they start to go bad. You get so down on yourself and then you're at the store again and you're like, well, maybe I won't buy them this time because they're going to go bad. And it's like, well, maybe think about the thing you were going to buy corn, let's say, go get yourself some frozen corn instead. And then you can use the portion you want, put the rest in the freezer. Um, I've become a big fan of frozen vegetables in the last year or so, specifically for convenience reasons. Like I'll be uh, recipe testing a bunch of other stuff, but then I'm like, well, what am I eating for my diet, for my personal goals? And I start to rely on the frozen stuff because I can use the portion of it at the time that I need. I don't have to worry about it going bad. So I love this take on the fresh frozen canned. I just I really love that y'all covered it in here. Now we're looking at vegetables. Did, did you both, did you develop recipes together separately? What was your plan of action for this book when you wrote it? Yeah, we, I mean, we shared the responsibility as, as a far as uh, creating recipes. Um, I had so many ideas of just things that I create at home. And Dr. Burkos had so many cool ideas that she had experimented with cooking at home with her family and her kids. And so we just kind of like tag teamed it. Um, I think I, I did a little bit more recipe development just because that's my job you know sure sure, <laughs> sure. but we definitely shared the responsibility there that's great sharon in this chapter when we're talking about family and kids and vegetables is there a favorite vegetable recipe in here that your family has gravitated towards by any chance it's, you know when my kids I get, like to get them in the kitchen because i really think if you want to get your kids to eat healthy yes. the more they are part of the food decisions and making the foods, the more likely they are to eat it. Yeah. And the more fun we have with food prep, you know, the better. Mm -hmm. My kids love making those zoodles mm -hmm. with the spiralizers. Yeah. So, um, so we personally, we like the portabella zoodle recipe. Um, right. It's a portabella tomato zoodles because we just love using the zucchini for noodles. Um, and it's fun. It's just, so different for them and they get so excited about eating it and making it and um it's just the process makes it fun i love that so much and also when you get your kids to help it's like you have uh two little or two three four five how many kids you have i don't know but you have like a little three you got three, three. sous chefs right three there help, three helpers yeah, yeah right there <laughs> just doing the prep it's good work good for that i wish my dog could you know get, get his <laughs> chef's chef knife skills together uh jenny for vegetable recipes in here What's one that you would tell someone who just picks up this book, they just get it, what's a recipe you would say to make first from the vegetable chapter? 
Yeah, and I think this one is like the very first recipe that's in there, but the marinara sauce is one of my favorites to tell people. And one of the reasons why is because I feel like when I'm having conversations about patients trying to get in more veggies, we automatically go to like salads and raw veggies, which is awesome and those are sure. great, but I think it's helpful to know that there are a variety of ways that we can get in veggies. It can be a sauce that we use on our pasta or, we, or the zoodles or something like that. So getting creative and knowing that it can be cooked veggies, it can be tomatoes. So the marinara sauce is great. It's super easy and it's cheaper than marinara sauce. Nice. <laughs> Even better. Yeah, Even so better. definitely one of my favorites and one that I've been using at home all the time. That's great. You're hitting all the points with it, too. And everybody, the title of it is Easiest Marinara Sauce. So <laughs> it is it is a champion there for you. We got other items in here like simple roasted sweet potatoes, sweet potato chips, creamy tomato soup with squash, red potatoes, green beans, and chickpeas, lazy chef stir fry, soy sauce collie bites, buffalo collie bites, and roasted radishes with dill. I just started roasting radishes like last year. It's life changing. They're like, great. I, it's so I did it because I just had some. I was like, let's just roast these and see. And I was like, this is delicious. Yeah. Uh huh. Was, and this with dill. I mean, come on, come mm -hmm. on. I'm into it. Our next chapter is green uh, leafy vegetables. You go over a variety of greens in detail in the beginning of this chapter, citing the health benefits and science behind them. I love greens. I love exploring new greens and new ways to cook familiar greens. So what's a recipe out of that? Because I feel like I'm in good company. We probably all really like greens here on this call. So what is a recipe for each of you out of this chapter that is a go-to recipe for a leafy green? Dr. B, you want to go first? Sure. Well, for me, it's you build your own power bowl. Mm -hmm. It's so versatile. If I come home from work, I usually want to know what do I have that I can throw together. And, and like you mentioned, Dustin, you don't want your veggies to go to waste, right? So that's such a easy go to because whatever's in the fridge and whatever you want to use up, you can throw into a power bowl. Um, and we also have some awesome uh dressings and, and at the end of the day is the sauce right that yes, helps yes. make these power bowls so um we usually have the dressings pre-made for a lot of them and the power bowls are so easy to just put together and what we put in the cookbook is really just a template for a mix and match right so to give people ideas of things that can go together and it gives people a lot of control to make it their own and I think whenever you're trying to do plant-based recipes, it's so important to use your personal preferences, but also know how to make some swaps um, so that you can make that recipe, but make it in a way that, you know, is right for you and your family. So um, yeah, that's, that's my favorite. Fantastic. Yeah, but I had that one on my list too, Dr. B. That, that one's just great because it's so versatile. And like you said, it, it's really fun and gets people more motivated and inspired to be experimental in the kitchen when you have like a template like that. Um, the other ones that I really like in the leafy green category are the massage kale salads. Those are great because mm. there's two different versions. There's a savory and then there's a sweet one. And for those that are hesitant to incorporate kale into their regimen, there it gives some tips on how to make it more palatable through the massage technique. Yes, yes. And it makes it softer, it makes it taste better. It's great. So that was a way to just like include a tip about how to incorporate kale and enjoy it a little bit more. <laughs> Absolutely. Everyone, massage your kale. That kale has worked hard. It deserves a massage. Like, come on. And really, truly, I just had, we had some friends over for the weekend and we, I, it's just funny you say massage kale. Every time I've got to do like a dinner, it's a massaged kale Caesar. I'm like, I'm just, people are familiar with Caesar. They're scared of kale, but then I'm going to massage it. And then I put some shiitake bacon on the top. They're like, what's happening here? The salad's delicious. I'm like, I know it's delicious. You just got to massage your kale. I'm like, yeah. cause then you can chew it. You can digest it easier. All the things, you know, I don't need to tell you what's on everyone who's listening. Well, listen, there's some great other uh, items in there. We got rainbow ginger slaw, Swiss chard rolls, slow cooker, miso cabbage, and mushroom soup, arugula green grape and pepita salad, slow cooker, zucchini, lasagna, strawberry citrus salad. And we've got uh, pinto bean, mushroom, and kale enchiladas with a homemade sauce. Chapter four takes us into fruits. You go over antioxidants, how to select ripe fruit, 
dried fruit, blending and juicing. I love a cookbook like this because it is, you get right, you're giving us education and information and you get right to it. I don't have to read three, four pages on why you're going to talk about how to choose the fruit. You're going to tell me how to choose the fruit. And I love this. And you address many other topics on fruit. There's one in here I would love for you to elaborate on. I'll let you all decide who takes this question. But for the listeners, they want to know, can you get too much sugar from fruit? I'll, I'll answer that. Um, so no is the short version. Yes. Um, I I'm... mean, yes, no. No, yes. The answer is no when I say yes. <laughs> Um, this does, this is one of probably the most pervasive myths around fruit, right? I have so many patients who are trying to prevent diabetes or manage their blood sugar and have somehow just understood from their reading that they need to restrict fruit. And nothing could be more different from that. We you know that, in fact, in a lot of studies, the more fruit people eat, the more likely they are to stave off not just diabetes, but heart disease, dementia, you know, just any chronic condition. The next question then becomes why, right? So why is it that when you add sugar, it can increase the risk of diabetes and all these chronic diseases, whereas when you have the sugar in the fruit, it's reducing the risk. Mm -hmm. And it, again, it all comes back down to the fiber. That's a huge part of it and, and the phytonutrients. But in the fruit, in the whole fruit, the sugars are bound to the fibrous walls. So when you're having the fruit intact, you, your body has to break down the fiber to release the sugar. And that is the process of digestion. It takes time. So by the time those sugars are released, it's done in a really slow way. When you have that sugar taken out of the context of the fiber, so you're adding the sugar like fruit juice, mm -hmm. there's no fiber. Immediately it goes into the stomach, the stomach absorbs it right into your bloodstream and you get this rapid spike. So I think the important part here is you have to look at the form of the food, right? It's not just glucose and fructose. I mean, it's the same sugar and table sugar versus fruit. You have to look at it in the context of the you know, matrix of the food versus lack of. And that's really the, the key behind the difference. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. And I, I love just, uh, just that you tackle all these items about fruit in here, but also this one is so big for people and it's just what everyone's just always saying it, you know, and I've got, you know, I work with some really great dietitians at PCRM and I, there was, I was working with a coach once who was asking me not to have fruit for a while. And they, my the my dietitian colleagues were like what why what's going on who's your coach i need to talk to them and i was like i was like i swear it's fine i swear it's fine it's just like and then i started eating fruit again i was like i'm eating fruit i'm eating fruit it's like i understood it but i was also like following these guidelines and doing a thing which i think is the confusion a lot of people get into mm -hmm. right like they start to follow guidelines for something and all of that so i appreciate you elaborating some we've got a lot of fun ways to put fruit to use in here banana bread three ways we've got the blueberry pumpkin seed banana bread that one looks like a winner for me but they all look good slow cooker chickpeas and mangoes creamy jackfruit taquitos summer berry cobbler raspberry filled dark chocolate cups tropical jicama salad dreamsicle tofu pudding mm, mini apple pie bites and nice cream now jenny in this chapter because these seem like great things you could like pull out in the summer or take to a party is there one you'd recommend for somebody to take to a gathering that might be a crowd pleaser from here yes the banana bread for sure mm. is great and i've gotten definite okays and loves and bring this again yes to all of my vegan friends but also all of my non-vegan friends too which is great so yeah that one is definitely a great crowd pleaser and again what's cool is like it's versatile so there's you can put any toppings in there that you want which is great um it's also near and dear to my heart because it's probably one of the first recipes that I ever created for the book that yeah. I had started. And there's what's cool is as part of our book, we kind of put little blurbs to just talk about like why plant-based seeding sure. is a journey. And that is definitely one of them. That's like, I started that. And when I was doing my undergraduate 
degree and has just carried on through the rest of the time. And now it's published in a book, which is super Yeah. Cool. Oh, I love that. I love that. And y'all, banana bread is just like, uh, it, you, I like to make them for like, if it's a holiday weekend, weekend or whatever day of the week it falls on, but if it's like a holiday and you're going to be with family, cause you don't want to be making food all the time. There's going to be all this food, but like, it's a nice little, like, just a little nosh to have on the side. If you're like, Oh, I'm like a little, like I want like a little something, but dinner's going to be in three hours. So like, I don't want to like have a big sun, you know, it's like one of those things. So I just love having it around, take it to a cabin for a weekend and have some, but just see, I've had a history with banana bread myself. Clearly I'm having all these memories right now. Well, chapter five takes us into legumes. You go over a variety of legumes to open the chapter and talk about the magical qualities of them all ranging from being high in protein fiber that good good fiber vitamins minerals and phytonutrients i love me a spice chickpea so i need to make those from this chapter first and foremost now dr b what's a recipe we're talking about kids here again you got kids so i'm curious if they've got a favorite uh like if there's a staple from this legumes chapter maybe that has made it into your home because i feel like vegetables beans you want to get this to the kids what's a good one there in your home that's made it to the table a few times oh in our family it's the chocolate chip um cookie dough made with chickpeas very good um my kids so it's allowed as a lunch and a dinner in our home because there is more protein and fiber and you know with the oats the whole grains in there than most lunches and dinners that most kids have so they love the fact that they can have quote dessert mm -hmm. uh, for lunch or dinner and it's just packed with nutrients and they can't tell the difference yeah. from the store-bought kind so it's definitely a crowd pleaser we make it a lot in do our they family. take that i'm assuming you're uh, uh, do they do they take that like to school in their lunchbox are they able oh they do and, and doesn't we leave it as raw cookie dough because mm -hmm. i mean this is a vegan recipe there's nothing to cook in there yeah and they just scoop raw cookie dough yep and absolutely love it that way and we do cook some but truly they like having it raw more than they yeah. like it cooked yeah and yeah so they just have raw cookie dough for lunch and just think it's such a treat <laughs> i was just thinking like how cool that would have been back in the day when i was if i opened my lunchbox i'm just like i have cookie dough and teachers are like probably like wait wait and you're like no no like it's legumes i'm good <laughs> Like I, this is all like health forward promise. Uh, Jenny legumes. What's, what's a ringer for you in this chapter? What's a love for you in this chapter? My favorite is the five bean chili one. Mm -hmm. um, chili is like my bread and butter. I love it. It's so good. Um, I, I'm just like a fan of soups and stews and, and different things like that in general. And, and it's often a way that I encourage people to try out vegan and plant-based eating. Sure. Because beans are really important in a plant-based diet because they're such an essential source of protein right and so it's i i think that one is a great way to not only try a variety of different things but it's also familiar to a lot of people too you know chili is again versatile and oftentimes is made with animal protein but you can create this awesome five bean version of it that tastes just as good if not better in my yeah. <laughs> opinion yeah but is familiar at least. So that's definitely one of my favorite. And it's a slow cooker recipe. So you can put it in your slow cooker and let it sit there and you don't have to do anything. <laughs> no muss, no fuss. I love a slow cooker recipe. Jenny, I feel like we have to cook together. So far I'm like, I'm aligned, I'm aligned. I mean, all of us really, we're talking cookie dough, we're talking chili, I'm into it. Uh, we got a mashed buffalo chickpea salad in here, veggie chickpea hummus salad, baked tempeh fingers, uh, slow cooked black bean tacos, curried eggplant and red lentils. And tell me about this perfect vegan pumpkin pie. How are legumes getting, we already got the cookie dough magic here, but how are legumes getting like snuck into the mix here in this pumpkin pie? Oh, soybeans. That's the secret. Ah, um, so it's tofu. Um, and we, go. then we got, that's a legume. Perfect. Very nice, complete protein actually so a wonderful way to get your protein and have your pie and eat it too <laughs> that's right yes i didn't i saw it in that chapter and i was like i'm not going to look at the ingredients because i want to be surprised by the answer to this and yes tofu that makes perfect sense i love it uh we've got uh chapter six here it looks like i'm on whole grains yes so as in the other chapters 
you give us a rundown talking about what a whole grain is in this chapter to the health benefits of a whole grain. You even give a how-to on reading whole grain labels. So what is a favorite whole grain for each of you and a recipe you've applied it to in this book? I do, one of my favorites is, is barley, but also farro too. I think we have a farro recipe in, in our book somewhere. Um, but my favorite in this particular section is the cold day barley soup. That is a staple. And like I said, I'm a soup girly. So like, I'm going to choose soup any chance that I get. Um, but I think that that's a fun, unique way to incorporate barley again to people that maybe haven't cooked with it before. And it's a one pot recipe, so you can throw everything in there and it's really savory and delicious. And like for those cold, snowy, like gross days, it's like such a comfort. So that one's one of my favorites. Very good. And barley too. I, I think maybe uh, I don't cook with barley enough. So I'm already like, ooh, I need to explore that more. That's great. What about you, Dr. B? What's one for you? Um, I mean, I'm all into farro and barley. Love them. Um, we use a ton of oats. Um, again, oats are so versatile. Um, one of my favorite recipes in there is the homemade granola bars. Mm. I sound like the dessert queen, um, but, <laughs> but that's not a bad thing. <laughs> but when you make your own and you use the, you know, gran the rolled oats and you can control what you're putting in there mm. and you know, you're putting just all whole ingredients with no preservatives and they're really easy to make and once you learn to make one you can make dozens because you can swap out the different dried fruits and nuts um you know just different twists to it so they're infinite varieties and so we're we're big fans of the the rolled oat type recipes nice nice and you've got a slew of overnight oats in here we've got the apple cinnamon banana coconut and blueberry uh, we got some baked quinoa in here crispy kale grain bowl autumn quinoa salad and a morning glory muffin and black rice pudding. And this takes us into chapter seven, nuts and seeds. I know a lot of people shy away from nuts because of fat, but tell us why nuts are good for you. Jenny, give us a little glimpse here. Why are nuts good for us? Nuts are really great for us because they are a good source of unsaturated fatty acids. So they provide good anti-inflammatory nutrients through omega-3s and other uh, mono and polyunsaturated fats, which is wonderful. They also are satiating. So when we're talking about plant-based eating, one of the great benefits is that it tends to be lower in caloric density, right? And that is helpful for a lot of different things, but we also wanna make sure that we're incorporating good satiating nutrients to make sure that our meals keep us full for a long period of time. And nuts are a wonderful way to do that. So be liberal with things like walnuts, peanuts, pecans, almonds, cashews, all of them are wonderful. And again, they're a plant-based food, so they're also incorporating fiber. So you yeah. get healthy fats, but also fiber. So, and we already know all the different benefits that we get from fiber content. Yeah, I love that. And you've got some, I mean, I just love that there is a chapter dedicated to nuts and seeds because I'm, I'm here for it. And some great items in here to choose from like blender, nut butter, pancakes, coconut macaroons, tahini, Brussels sprouts, baked walnut falafel, chai chia pudding, tofu spring rolls, and buffalo tahini chickpea burgers. Now, I know, like, I'm still, I guess I like them all. I was going to say that peanut butter is my favorite, but I love peanut butter. I like cashew butter. I like almond butter. I, just, I like, and sunflower seed butter. I love it all. <laughs> so what about for each of you? What's your favorite, so, what's your favorite nut or seed and an, um, favorite recipe to use it in, in here? Dr. B, you go first. Um, most common in our household is just peanut butter. Um, mm -hmm. but we also use a lot of almond butter. And we even just last night made the peanut butter balls with the flaxseed and the nut butter. Um, so perfect blend of getting your seeds and nuts. And, you know, you're getting all the anti-cancer fighting benefit of the flaxseed and the nuts, as Jenny just said, they're so satiating. Um, you know, when people eat nuts, they actually it correlates with people weighing less. So I understood that there's the concern about um, the fat, but it's good fat. And when you're having, you know, a handful a day, 
they're tremendous health benefits. Mm -hmm. So we're a um, peanut butter ball family. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, mine. Um, I feel like the one that we use the most is probably almond butter. Mm -hmm. uh, my husband's allergic to peanuts, so we don't do peanuts. <laughs> Takes that out then. Takes that one out of the house completely. Yeah, but almonds yep. we do all the time, and almond butter is great. And yes, similar to Dr. B, we love the energy bites. Those are awesome with the oats and the flaxseed and with the almond butter, it's wonderful. And again, just uh, to harp on it uh, as a, something that we really tried to foster in this book is versatility, you know, mm -hmm. so an energy bite recipe allows you to be able to put whatever ingredient topping that you want. So whatever flavor that you're craving for that week, go for it. And then you get all of the awesome benefits from the almond butter and the oats and, and flaxseed and different things. That's great. And I love that you you do talk about, you know, mixing it up and sort of choosing your own path. Eventually. I like to say to people like, especially people who are just getting into cooking for the first time and cooking in general, but cooking with plants, of course, like learn some rules, but the point of learning rules and cooking is so that you can break them eventually and do what is authentic to you and do what aligns with your goals and all of those things like that. Do create the things that are satiating specifically to you, because while we are talking about these uh, specific items that can be satiating and fill you up, everybody's different, right? So your bowl that fills you up and satiates you might look different for somebody else. So it's great to sort of have the, these bases in here and um, these guidelines and all of this, these one, this wonderful education for people where they can start to really find their way with food. You really have created sort of a map for people for here to stick to and then sort of be like, oh, I want to maybe try this little thing they were talking about too. So it really is a versatile book like that, um, which I think uh, the home cook can certainly appreciate. And the last recipe chapter we have is herbs and spices. Tell us the science behind herbs and spices being good for us. Tell us, tell us, whoever's feeling it. I personally am such an advocate of herbs and spices because the antioxidant content is so underappreciated. I don't think most people realize that by weight, spices have 10 times the antioxidants of fruits and vegetables. So it is such a powerful way to really boost your health. So being in the habit of a pinch here, half a teaspoon here, and it's such a great way to add flavor but substitute for the salt and sugar. Mm -hmm. So I highly encourage people to everything that you do, if you're having something sweet, like oatmeal, put a dash of cinnamon, you will not miss the, you know, not adding sugar because it adds sweetness. And if you want to not use, you know, oils and avoid the salt, put rosemary, put oregano, like they're so underutilized and you're getting not just the, lack of the you know salt and sugar but the powerful boost of the antioxidants so they're tremendously underutilized they have a ton of phytochemicals in them um just a real miss to not be eating them and they add so much flavor i mean you can get so much cuisine from around the world with different combinations and it's just a beautiful food adventure when you add the spices i think adventure is the big word there because really I've been in the culinary landscape for about 10 years. First of all, I failed my spice identification class in <laughs> culinary school. Um, it happened very quickly and I was like, I'm totally going to nail this. And then like, cause you had to like taste them and smell them and identify them. And I, I just was a disaster at it. I was like, I got it. No problem. I was like, I needed to study a little more, uh, but it also comes with time. Right? So now I think I do a little better, but the cool thing is what I'm trying to say is even after all these years is like, there's always spices popping up that you haven't tried before. So if you just, you know, see something and it perks your interest, you know, spend a couple bucks, try it out. Sometimes, you know, if you're at a spice market, you can get like a little sample spice of something and try it that way. Take it home and try it that and then go buy more if you like it. So I really love um, saying adventure because I think that's so true. You can take a dish you've been making for years and totally change the flavor profile of it if you sort of expand your approach with herbs and spices, I think. And you have a top seven list of spices in here. We've got turmeric, ginger, garlic, oregano, cinnamon, cumin, cayenne pepper. Now, which is your, I'm going to assume 
I'm going to ask you what your favorite spices are, each of you, for health benefits. So I assume it falls in this top seven list if we're talking about health benefits. So curious what your favorite spice is for health benefits and, and how you it, it go, comes into play in a recipe in this chapter. Sure. My favorite is turmeric. It is one of the most well-studied spices in terms of anti-inflammation. And we can visually see the antioxidant power of turmeric through that crazy orange color that it gives us. Um, and what's really cool about turmeric is that you can do a cool pairing with turmeric with black pepper to help with the absorption of curcumin, which is the antioxidant found in turmeric. So you get a little spice blend going in there and you get multiple benefit and it helps the absorption there. So I always love giving that tip. And um, one of the recipes that we incorporate turmeric is the uh, vegetable masala. And we love that one because one, it has all different types of spices. It has mm -hmm. garlic, it has uh, cumin, it has chili powder, it has all different types of stuff. But um, it's a great way to incorporate turmeric because it is a very earthy kind of potent flavor if you're not used to it. And so incorporating with, in conjunction with other spices, it helps, but also provides that awesome orange crazy color mm -hmm. palatable way. Lovely. I'm a cumin fan myself. We put cumin in so many recipes that make it so savory. It has such a lovely earthy tone to it. And it's also packed with iron. I don't think a lot of people realize that just a tablespoon of cumin has the same amount of iron, actually a little bit more than five ounces of a sirloin steak. Wow. Like it is crazy high in iron. And when you're following a plant-based diet, I think iron is, you know, another one of the vitamins that and minerals that is so important to make sure you're getting enough of. So um, it's just, again, beautiful flavor, so lovely in meals to make it so earthy and savory. And uh, just the nutrient is tremendous. Oh, uh, you're blowing my mind with facts and figures today. I love this. I love it. So good. Uh, well, I've got my eye on the garlic nutritional yeast chickpeas uh but we've got lots of great stuff in here spicy turmeric tonic green tea latte carrot ginger rosemary soup slow cooker pinto beans and okra it all sounds just so yummy and comforting and i think um this will be a nice uh chapter for home cooks to explore to really sort of get to know herbs and spices a little more and then of course get to know the health benefits of it the science behind it right which is what we're about with this book plantology uh so i i appreciate you taking this spin on this here and of course you've got a collection of dressings in here too that you talked about and it's all about the sauce all about the sauce we uh we love dressings in this house, dressing sauces. We've always got different ones uh, rotating in the fridge. What's a couple, each of you give me your favorite dressing from this book here to round this out. The balsamic hummus mm. is awesome. The flavor of the balsamic and the creamy of the hummus just make it this thick, satisfying, and no oil. Yeah you know, dressing. And I think it's just so rare to be able to get that kind of creaminess without the fat and the mm -hmm. oil that comes with so many dressings. Um, so I would highly recommend, and it's so easy to make. Um, and you can put whatever spices you want in there to, you know, we often put a lot of oregano and a little bit of rosemary sometimes in there and just the flavor of the balsamic it just comes through so strong. It's delicious. Mm. Yeah, I love that one too. I love uh, the buffalo tahini dressing. It's literally two ingredients and water. And I love everything that's spicy and hot sauce. <laughs> that one's a great one. And then you can literally put it on anything. I'll put it on salads. I'll put it on um, uh, tacos. I'll put it on so many different things. So that one's a super easy one. Both of these dressings. Also, I just opened a page that, that everyone needs to hear. Uh, turnip fries. Turnip fries in here. But I mm -hmm. wanted to read the dressings for everyone. We got tahini, lemon tahini dressing, balsamic hummus dressing, lemon citrus dressing, dairy-free Caesar dressing, buffalo tahini dressing, balsamic vinaigrette, apple cider ginger vinaigrette, and apple cider Dijon vinaigrette. And that rounds out Plantology, a cookbook based on the science 
of plant-based eating. Now I have to ask both of you, what is your book brag for this book? So a book brag is something, I mean, you can just plain out brag. You have all the bragging rights. I'm holding the bragging rights in my hand, but uh, something you're most proud of when it comes to this book. For me, we wanted to really encourage people to have a diverse amount of plant-based foods. And a lot of cookbooks are organized by entree, appetizer, dessert. And we wanted to organize it as we just went through by plant-based food group to help people ex you know, expose themselves to the flavors, the varieties of the different ones in each of the plant-based food groups and to organize the recipes by the food type just so people break the association that a certain food has to be for breakfast and a different food is a dessert. The goal is to get as much plant-based foods as you can. And we have a checklist of how many you wanna get of whole grains per day, how many fruits, how many vegetables. And however you check your boxes, whether it's three desserts in one day, mm -hmm. <laughs> It's really structured so that we're breaking that mold and trying to just get people to have an abundance. So it's my book brag is that we're all about abundance and variety and steering away from restriction mentality around eating. That's great. Yeah, I think my book brag is two things. And, and one of them is the versatility concept of empowering people to get experimental in the kitchen. I think those that are wanting to cook more at home feel really rigid by a recipe. And we did a good job of coming up with variation tips, different toppings, different ingredients you could plug and drop in there based off of what you have at home. Mm -hmm. So again, encourage more um, excitement and palatability with the recipes. And I tried really hard to make sure that we used ingredients that were common. You know, I think when it comes to vegan and plant-based eating, there's a variety of different crazy stuff out there, you yeah. know, and I'm like all about it. But at the same time, I think those that are wanting to transition to more plant-based eating can be intimidated by that. And so I tried really hard to make recipes with just like everyday stuff, like rolled oats and canned tomatoes and yeah. frozen broccoli, you know? And so easy, simple things to keep people from being afraid of trying something. Yes, yes. I say mission accomplished and you're right. I mean, accessibility, that's what this book seems to be all about for me. The education, but also then the approachability. Approachability, that's a word, right? Is that a word? Did I make it up? <laughs> no, it's good. Um, how approachable it is and the accessibility of it. Um, I was getting accessibility, approachability mixed up in there. Anyways, uh, but I do appreciate that about this book so much. I think it's going to be help so many people and it already has and it will continue to do so for years to come. So congratulations on plantology. We're going to move on to your rapid fire round of questions. Are you ready? Yeah. Woohoo! All right, here we go. And you can sort of, you know, bounce off of each other. Whoever goes first doesn't matter to me. Whatever. You're both going to answer each question. So here we go. Favorite spice to cook with? Hmm. I said turmeric before, but my favorite spice of all time is probably cumin. <laughs> 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 Flip -flop. Yeah. Um, and ironically, you know, we're flipping uh, turmeric. I use all the time in so many foods too. So it's it's hard to pick a favorite spice. We have so many. Yeah. The yeah. most common one we get on here is smoked paprika. So, yeah, I, no, but I love this answer and how it's it's you know it's like <laughs> I've had time now. I also like that one as well. So I mean, it it makes sense. You wrote it together. I mean, come on. All right, favorite outdoor activity. Jogging. I'm all, I love being out in nature running. Yeah. Um, it's been, it's, it's not, well, I guess it's been chillier, but it's going to be spring soon. That's nice here in Atlanta. Right. Um, gardening, I think is one of my favorite. Really? Yeah. Do you <laughs> like, have a nice garden space? We are working on it right now. So we're like planning right. on creating our beds and growing flowers right. and and stuff so um, my brain is on that right now so. yeah my poor husband has gotten really into it but we only have we're in a condo and on the the porch he is the, like our 
patio out there. He's a t he did a very good job last year. We had some great tomatoes and peppers growing and stuff, but it's like I feel bad because it's such a small space. He's, I'm like, we need to help him expand somewhere. We got to <laughs> find a place. But uh, if you could pick up a certain skill instantly, what would it be? Photography. Oh, um, good I've always wanted to be good at taking photos and I never get the lighting right. So that would definitely be my preferred skill. It's yeah. the lighting's fault, not yours. Don't worry. <laughs> I feel like dancing. I feel ah. like that's a skill that I don't have. Like I'm pretty athletic and other things, but dancing is something that I have such a hard time with. Like I wish I could just look at a choreographer and be able to do it. Now, are you talking like freestyle dancing, like at a wedding? Or are you talking like you want to be able to pick up a choreographed move? choreograph move you know okay. like when you're just like hanging out with your girlfriends and you have a dancer friend that can literally just like sure a tiktok dance super yep. easy and yep. i'm in the background like i i you're like what's happening what's yeah going. and you're like just leave me out of this one you guys have fun i'll be over here cheering you on i understand mm -hmm. yeah uh what is your must-have tool in the kitchen Ooh. vitamix very good yes. yeah <laughs> Yeah, for us, it's our um, little smoothie maker. Mm -hmm. um, so we just blend everything in there. Yep, yep. I'm I'm not even going to say, I, I'm knock on wood, my Vitamix has been around a long time. That's all I'm saying, and I'm very proud of it. I'm very, I'm very proud of you. I'm looking at you on the counter back there. Uh, all right, favorite bean? Ooh. Black bean for me. Love black beans. Um, again, so versatile and just i love the flavor it and it can be so it can be smoky it can be um used you know in a dessert recipe i just love black beans you can use it in a dessert recipe oh black it? bean the, brownies oh the book i have coming out you know it's always been a, a raspberry uh brownie but i did a blueberry black bean brownie mm. oh i know yeah. <laughs> that sounds so good I have been really loving butter beans lately. Mm. I know that one's like a little different than what most people go for, but they're like very aesthetically pleasing because they're like big and fat and flat. And mm -hmm. so I've been using those a lot and love the flavor of them. Yes. Yes. All right. Got to get into some butter beans. Favorite way to cook corn? A grill. Yeah. Mm. Definitely. the. I like that flavor of the grill. So um, yep. it's, can't lose that way. Yeah. yeah, same. That's my favorite way, too. Very good. Favorite way to prepare a potato? Ooh. Uh, um, potato chips, but homemade. Yeah. Um, uh, so air fryer potato chips. Nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would say air fryer fries. Yes. So good. Yeah. So good. The only problem is there's not an air fryer in this world that's big enough to make as many fry <laughs> air fryer fries as I want to make. That's the problem with air fryers, everybody. Um, we got this new oven and it said it had an air fryer feature and we tried it and I'm like, this just, it's just a, a convection of it. It's not like doing, it's not, you know, but I, but thank you, you know, <laughs> thanks for the label. I can say it has an air fryer on it, but we still use the air fryer if that's telling at all. Uh, if you can be an animal, what would you be and why? Oh, that's a great question. A puppy. Everybody, oh, would, <laughs> everybody loves you and you yes. can go to anybody and get pet and rubbed and mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's what I would be in my next life. So true. So true. <laughs> right I feel like maybe a bear. I feel like oh. bears are cool. Bears <laughs> they're kind of cool. scary, but they're also kind of cute at the same time. Have you ever seen one in real life? Um, No, I haven't. I feel like I have potentially might have seen one like far in the distance. Sure, sure, sure. Like, yeah. Down. I haven't. I asked because when we used to go, when we lived in New York, we'd go to the Catskills and there's these hikes we'd go on where it would say to clap if you saw a bear. Mm -hmm. And I still don't understand why I'm clapping. It's to keep them from coming up on you. and So like I don't scare. It's like I'm supposed to let them know I'm there. That way there's not. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay. You're supposed to make noise. Like if you're on hiking trails to ah. scare them away so they don't get curious about you. Okay. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. We were for years. We've been, and I guess I don't know why we haven't looked it up, but we've been like, why did it tell us to clap? So now every time a bear comes up, I think of that. I'm like, why was I supposed to? Okay. Uh, I went on a tangent. Sorry. What dish did each of you make last? Ooh. What did we make? Oh, we made a stir fry. It's basically mm. a version of Lazy Chef stir fry. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> of course it is. Come on. We made homemade sushi. Yes. I thought you were going to say, listen, dessert queen. I thought you were going to say the chickpea cookie dough. I was going to be like, okay, no surprise. But sushi is fantastic. The cookie dough sushi. Just kidding. Just kidding. Okay. Your last one. A place you want to visit that you haven't been to yet. Oh, my gosh. There's so many. Um, I'm going to say Australia. Same. Same. Uh, it's great, y'all. I've been there. It's oh. awesome. <laughs> How long did you go for? Uh, I was there. It was um, the first time I left the country. I was there for a study abroad program when I was. Oh, so that was, sounds like the way to do it. For like a month. And it was, oh, that's the thing. You got to make it worth your while because you got the, it's a long trip. Yep. Long flight. So you got to make it worth <gasps> it. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say. I want to go to Greece. Yeah, very good. good. And I know Dr. B's been to Greece. Yes, and <laughs> highly recommend. <laughs> very good. Well, that's your rapid fire. Well done. Please tell everyone if you would like to be found, where they can find you on social media or websites or anything like that. Anything else you got going on that you want to tell people about? Um, so you can find me on Instagram at Dr. Sharon Berklist, Um, and our book is on Amazon. It's Plantology. Yes. Yeah, you can also find me on Instagram at jbilko, and yeah, find our book on Amazon. Perfect, perfect. So listen, everybody, get your copy of Plantology, a cookbook based on the science of plant-based eating on Amazon. Jenny and Dr. B, thank you so much for making the time to chat. It was just so wonderful to uh, really dive into this book and learn more about it and learn more about you and the process of it. So I really appreciate you taking the time to be here today. Thank you. Thank you for having us. This has been a Muzzy Cat production. (laughs) Oh, <laughs>